Okay, I'm not sure it's going to work on Instagram. Hi, everybody. We are having uh, some trouble. I'm trying to get the live to work on uh, our um, Instagram channel, but at the moment, I do not think that that is going to happen. No, all it's doing on Instagram is taking pictures. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that is not helpful. I don't know why it won't go live for us, but I am trying. Uh, let me see if this will work. Now, for some reason, Instagram on your iPad will not let you uh, go live. Okay, well, uh, hopefully those of you that are watching can jump on via um, YouTube. Facebook, uh, Twitter, or TikTok. And we will take your questions there. If you are trying to watch on Instagram, you're not gonna see us. So um, hopefully everybody will jump on. So we typically uh, allow everyone a few minutes to jump on. I'm your host, Dr. Rocky Victory. Welcome to Fertility Factor Fiction. This is our weekly show where we review all the topics in infertility that are pertinent to people and that will help their journey be better and stronger and more successful. Um, we typically stream across multiple platforms, but unfortunately today I cannot do that uh, because of the fact that the software that we use to do that is completely glitching and no one knows why. Um, so we've had some people working on it through the day, but it is not working. Uh, I am joined by Ali, who is uh, here instead of uh, my uh, wonderful friend Tarek from Ibrahim Strategies Group. So Ali, thank you for being here. We appreciate you helping us out. And if I can figure out how to get this silly uh, thing to work, I would, but it definitely is not working. So I don't know what's wrong with Instagram. I wish I could get that up and running for everybody. Uh, well, anyways, um, I do have an article to review with you guys tonight. Um, those of you who are watching on TikTok, uh, I can't show you the article but I will tell you what the contents showed. And I think this is a really important article to share with everybody because of the fact that on um, a day-to-day -day basis, this is something we deal with all the time. So a lot of people have explored the possibility that using progesterone for patients that have bleeding in pregnancy, whether they're fertility pregnancies or they are natural pregnancies, may help to reduce the chances that they have a miscarriage. And the question has always been, we know progesterone relaxes the uterus, we know it can sustain pregnancies, we know it's critical for patients that have uh, to undergo fertility treatment, but is it going to prevent a miscarriage? And this has been a, a very long time question with lots of different studies that have tried to address it. So there was a reasonably recent study that they looked at, um, hoping to try and um, succeed uh, or, or demonstrate that it doesn't work with patients that um, have had bleeding in pregnancy to see if the progesterone can actually help facilitate uh, a reduction in the risk of miscarriage. So I'm gonna flip to that and you guys should all be able to see it if you're on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, I believe. Those of you on TikTok, we are looking at the new human reproduction article. It is as, it is as yet unpublished, but it will be coming out soon. It's called Progesterone for Women with Threatened Miscarriage. It's called the STOP trial, um, a placebo controlled randomized clinical trial. So a well done study. It's out of uh, Australia, um, and uh, here's what they did. They essentially took all the women that presented to one clinic, and if they had bleeding and they were less than 10 weeks, they put them on 400 milligrams of vaginal progesterone every night in a suppository. Um, it was like a pessary type suppository from the day that they started bleeding until 12 weeks. So it could have been for five days, it could have been for a week, or, or sorry, it could be for two weeks, it could have been for three weeks, 10 weeks, whatever the case was. But it, from the time you started bleeding until 12 weeks, and then they stopped it. And they screened all the women, and then they randomized them one-to-one -one into you either took the one with the progesterone or you took a placebo. And it, the people that were studying it were blinded and the patients were blinded. So they didn't know what they were getting. That is by far the best kind of study you can do. One in which you have both the uh, 
the patients blinded to the actual treatment so they don't know what they're getting. And the reviewers, the study people are also blinded so they don't know what the patients got. That way you're eliminating a lot of bias where the patients don't actually know, did they get progesterone or did they get placebo? And the people studying it don't know if they got progesterone or placebo, so they can't bias the results or, or try and push it one way or the other because you genuinely don't know which way you're pushing it. So in that regard, it's a good study. So um, the, the bottom line was um, the primary endpoint was live birth. So how many women made it to uh, the final endpoint? And then what they did was um, bring in all the women that they could, but they stopped the study after 278 women were randomized because they weren't seeing a difference between the two groups. So that's really important and obviously has a huge impact on you know, what the study shows. So the light, you can see here in the abstract, they ended up with 139 women getting progesterone and 139 women in the placebo group and they lost three in the progesterone group and six in the placebo group from the data results. The live birth rates were not different. It was 82.4 versus 84.2, and that was not statistically significantly different. And if you had had one previous miscarriage, they found that it also still was not different, 80.6 in the progesterone, 84.4. They also didn't see a difference if you'd had two or more miscarriages. So um, that also had a confidence interval that crossed one. So it didn't help in any of the groups that they looked at. It also didn't help for preterm birth in this particular study. And there was no difference in the birth weights. So let's take a little bit of a look at the study because they basically said, don't use it. It's not useful. Um, you should stop. So I want to kind of go through the actual criteria because this is kind of an interesting study for me to look at and kind of pick apart a little bit. So first part right here, um, and again, for those of you on TikTok, I apologize, there is no way for us to share this data with you on TikTok at the same time as on other platforms, but I'm going to tell you what they did. So there were 1,324 women that were eligible for this study. So a lot of women that showed up to this one clinic with bleeding prior to 10 weeks of pregnancy. What were the causes of bleeding? Could have been anything. Could have been abnormal embryo, could have been fibroids, could have been polyps, abnormal structure to the uterus. They included everybody. So out of the 1,324, 1,046 refused to participate. So that's basically almost 80% of the study population, about 70% of the study population. So they all refused to be in the study. So all automatically, you've lost an enormous chunk of the women that were eligible be, to be in the study. So you are biasing it to some extent by only taking the patients that were agreeable to being in the study. Maybe they were lower risk, maybe they didn't know better, who knows what the difference is, but the reality is you've eliminated a huge group of patients who should have been included in the study and work. So they ended up with 139 in the progesterone group and 139 in the placebo group. Two withdrew and there was no information. And then one somehow magically got lost to follow up in the progesterone arm. And in the placebo arm, four withdrew. And again, two were lost to follow up. So they ended up with 136 in the progesterone, 133 in the uh, placebo group. So automatically, you've got quite a huge staggering loss of data from all of these different withdrawals. Most of the people didn't participate, huge loss to the study protocol. And then on top of that, you have people withdrawing and then more that were lost to follow. Now, granted, the withdrawals and the loss to follow up were small points, like you're talking, you know, single digit percentage points. But nevertheless, they did pull out of the study and that's important. So when you look at the data, this is also really important for us to analyze. <clears throat> Average age, 30. Well, we have loads of women that are a lot older than 30 that are going through miscarriages and fertility. So the means here were plus or minus five, the standard deviations. So um, the problem with that is that study population is way younger than the study population we see. So does this apply to everybody? Probably not. They did include women from 18 and a half to 45 and a half, but you can see the majority of them were much younger and it's a fairly tight um, limit because that that uh, standard deviation is plus or minus five. 
Um, most of them had had multiple previous pregnancies, so that was important. Um, so the number of times they'd been pregnant was three in both studies. Um, and the majority had not had previous uh, deliveries. Um, some of them had infertility in both groups, and that was equally divided. Again, the infertility population is a unique population. Um, and, you know, they are uh, definitely more susceptible to needing progesterone. So including them doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, again, none of these people had had full term deliveries. Some of them smoked. Um, it was uh, five in the progesterone group, 10 in the placebo group. So automatically, that's a huge red flag. We know that with smoking, there's a 400% increase in miscarriage rate. And that's just if the female is smoking. If the male is smoking, it's also even higher because you have higher levels of sperm DNA damage, high levels of sperm DNA damage. Not a good thing for conceiving uh, because it cer certainly increases the risks of miscarriage. You're looking at almost a 12-fold increase in the risk of miscarriage if you have elevated sperm DNA fragmentation. So again, not a great idea. Um, the progesterone levels, as you can see here, uh, pretty reasonable. Everything kind of mapped out evenly between the two groups for that. They did measure the levels. Having said that, um, there was a significant percentage, almost 10%, which were less than 10. Um, the ideal number usually is over 10. There are studies that show that less than 10, you're at a higher rate of miscarriage. So again, we're losing chunks of patients here every time, which is really whittling away at the validity of this study. Um, uh, most of them were on uh, supplements, and then you can see that the majority of them um, had a, a normal fetal heart rate. Um, there were depression scores, um, anxiety scores, and stress scores, all of which are kind of, you know, significant enough to be observant of, and that's, that's obviously concerning for us as well. So uh, when they went through this data and they demonstrated that there was uh, no benefit to this, and they're showing that here, um, the live birth demonstrated no significance. So you can see in the p-values, they're not significant. And as you go down through all these p-values, you can see none of them are significant. There is no difference for any outcomes whatsoever. Miscarriage rates, the same. Pregnancy loss between 20 to 23 weeks, um, the same. Preterm births, the same. Uh, rupture of membrane, small for gestational age. They really looked at a number of different outcomes in this group. Every single thing came out the same. Um, they also looked at continuous outcomes, which are things like uh, weight, that wasn't any different. They looked at gestational age at delivery. Most of these patients delivered um, uh, on average near delivery time, like near 40 weeks, 38 to 39. Um, again, their stress scores and so on didn't change. Um, depression scores didn't change. So essentially they said, look, we've done all of this. There's no real difference. And then they started doing sub-analysis to see what if you had this, that, and the other thing? So they analyzed it by number of miscarriages, zero miscarriages, more than one, there was no difference. They looked at infertility. Again, there was no difference. They looked at maternal age, less than 40, greater than 40. Again, they showed no difference. Um, and then also looked at the baseline progesterone level, um, and that's at study entry, and again, they showed no difference. So not a lot of you know positive vibes coming from this um, at all. And it didn't demonstrate any uh, significance in any analysis that they did, as you can see there. So where are the problems with this study? Well, the problems are in their own limitations. So number one, they say right here, first our study was a single, single center trial. So it was only in one place, it was in Australia. Number two, they had a very low participation rate, 21%. So almost 80% of the patients bailed on this study before it even got started because it was a total waste of time and they weren't interested in what the study had to show or what it had to do. And then lastly, probably the most important part of this are the things that I pointed out to you. We have smokers in there. We didn't know if these were genetically normal pregnancies. Some of these people are going to miscarry no matter what you do because they're miscarrying a genetically abnormal pregnancy. So if you want to do this study properly, you actually have to do it with women that have no polyps, no fibroids, no abnormalities to their uterus. You got to try and include everybody. They all have to be doing IVF and you got to be using euploid embryos and they all have to have no previous history of miscarriages. And then when you do the study, you can say, okay, now I actually know if this works or not. What these guys did 
literally makes absolutely no sense whatsoever at all because they were looking at things that you they were looking at a population for a question that just doesn't fit together so you have to have the very specific population to study this so am i going to continue using progesterone of course i am there's a very good british study which actually showed and i, I think i have it here for you uh where is that nope i don't have it up at the moment sorry about that guys but here's the abstract and in this abstract they basically showed that when patients is a, a big British study, when patients used um, this progesterone treatment, they actually were able to demonstrate a very, very high level of significance, um, demonstrating that their results were very, very good. Um, I'm just trying to jump back into our thing. Ali, are you there? Ali is not there. I am not sure what happened there, guys. Yep. Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Dr. Victory. <clears throat> Everything working? Oh, I think we lost uh, some of our audience. Guys on TikTok, my apologies. Just wait a second while we respool into our thing here for some reason it did not work the first time <clears throat> can you hear me ali i think we can you hear me hello i can now we lost there we go. okay so i still have you it looks like you froze on the last one so i'll remove you off this one and add you here yeah, I think I don't know what happened there. Sorry about that. We probably lost some okay. questions too. Sorry about that. Um, for anybody that got bumped off, uh, we'll have to restart. Something went very glitchy because we froze. So um, if there are questions on TikTok, I am happy to take your questions while we spool up. And Ali, I'm sure you had some questions from before. I don't know if you had a chance to note those down or not. Did you? Yep. Yep. I'll be passing them over to you. Yeah, sure. You can fire those questions off to me on TikTok. If you have questions, um, just let me know. Yeah, and definitely it is not working on Instagram. So uh, I am ready for any questions. Here we go. Um, let me move this box over here. How many cycles after hyperstimulation can do frozen embryo transfer? So um, uh, I can answer questions generally here. I can't answer patient specific questions. So just be careful with the stuff that you ask. We got to stay within the legal boundaries. Um, so in general, if someone has ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, um, this is a condition where you tend to overproduce the number of eggs and uh, you can get some fluid buildup in your belly. It can be quite a bit of pressure, pain. Um, you may get uh, some organ system dysfunction um, and people can actually get quite sick from it because the main thing we worry about quite a bit is blood clots. So in the event that someone has hyperstimulation, we normally see it resolve within about a week. And um, generally speaking, we would wait about two months in our practice before we would go ahead and transfer another patient. I can't tell you what to do for yourself. You have to follow up with your doctor. Um, and I don't want to disclose to anybody on the show watching whether you're our patient or not, but certainly you should be following up with your doctor to see what is best for you um, and what the, the best protocol is for you. So that, that's what we would definitely recommend and uh, what we would like to see um, happen with the patients. Talk to your doctor, see what's best for you, figure it out. But certainly we would wait at least two months to give your ovaries a chance to cool down and give your estrogen levels a chance to cool down and, and get back to normal. Yeah. Um, I can't quite see the next question from Lisa. Uh, oh, there's one from Lisa on YouTube as well. You'll you'll bring that up, Ali. It doesn't matter either one. Hi, Doctor V. During stim, should gonal left be dosed 12 hours from the menopure? Yeah. So um, again, follow up with your doctor. These patient-specific level questions are hard to answer, but 
Um, I can tell you that none of the protocols out there recommend that any of the meds be taken at any other times than any others. So for a general protocol, if you're using Gonalef, Menopur, Recavel, Menopur, Falstem, it doesn't matter what drugs you're using, um, they can all be used, Luveris, they can all be used at the same time. So um, I don't think that you ne necessarily have to split them apart. Some people do, um, but some people will, um, you know, take them at the same time. I think the majority of our patients probably take their medications at the same time, and, and that's done very well with no problems at all. Um, oh, I got a great question from somebody. Do I have a time where my ego, I love these ones, where a time where my ego got a check with a patient? Uh, I certainly hope I don't have an ego. I just try and present data here. Um, but we have lots of patients that challenge us. And certainly on Instagram recently, I've had loads of patients that um, have had the equivalent of mean tweets because I believe women should be offered the truth about their uh, medical cases and their history and their options. And people online think that their opinion is better than science, which I fundamentally disagree with. So um, to whoever the dino system is, uh, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I certainly hope nothing we're saying here comes across as ego-driven. It's all just based on science and we're sharing information. So, um, if you have concerns, certainly express them. You're welcome to. Uh, okay, next question. Does a laparoscopy for acute management of ruptured ectopic pregnancy with normal looking organs sufficiently rule out chances of endo or not necessarily? Um, so uh, that's a good question and that's not patient specific. So uh, I love that one. Yeah. So during laparoscopy for an ectopic, especially if it's ruptured, there's a lot of blood in the pelvis. Um, and there can be some inflammation as a result. And it's often in the middle of the night and uh, not every surgeon is gonna spend the time at that point to go looking for microscopic spots of endo. On top of that, it can be fairly difficult to see endo when there's a lot of blood because even when you rinse out the pelvis, you don't necessarily get rid of every speck of blood. And you could be covering some of the endometriosis um, with blood splatter or a film of the blood that's on the pelvic walls or, or wherever the endo is. Um, so I would say it's reasonable to anticipate that if they did a thorough look and they were looking for it, and I certainly always try to do that, that there is uh, no reason why they would miss the endo in general. Um, but there are certainly cases where you could, and I've been there in those really bloody, you know, ectopics where the patients lost a lot of blood. And at that point in time, you're not focusing as much on, let's make sure that the patient has um, no endometriosis. You're focusing on making sure that the patient is stable. You're making sure that the bleeding is minimized. You want to get them out of the OR um, and stabilized as quickly as possible because you're worried about the blood loss. So um, I certainly wouldn't hold it against any of my colleagues if they missed endo during a laparoscopy for a ruptured ectopic. That would be um, concerning for sure. Yeah, and it's a, it's a high stress time for you. It's a high stress time for us. Um, I can take that. Can you explain the fertilisis tests a bit more, please? You want to do that one? Perfect. So Fertilsis is just a company. I have nothing to do with them financially. I don't promote them um, other than that. I like the tests that they do. Um, so uh, just so we're clear, I, I, they're just a testing facility for me. You can get the same tests they do done in other places. Um, there are labs in the US like the Beers Lab and there's a place in Chicago and there's a bunch of different places to do it. Um, I believe CREATE does a lot of these in Toronto. I don't know if they're doing the infection testing yet. Um, so uh, I'm certainly not promoting Fertilsis. We just use Fertilsis because it's cheaper and I like the guys that work there. They're really nice people. Um, so essentially there's two arms to the stuff we do there. Um, what we look at is uh, the infections in the vagina and the uterus which is called the uterine and vaginal microbiome. And then we also look at the um, uh, immune testing. So they'll look at NK cells. 
Uh, they'll look at your cytotoxicity. They'll look at DQ alpha. Um, they'll look at anti paternal antibodies. And then now they also have this new one um, for recurrent miscarriages called KIR. And the KIR testing is um, specialized testing for HLA types, which are proteins on your cells. So um, the rationale behind the infectious testing is very simple. There is a plethora of data demonstrating that if you have a, a low level of lactobacillus, um, you will not do well when you go through fertility. And by extension, we anticipate that there, if there are infections there, and this has been shown with endometritis data, that the endometrium won't function properly and you'll have a lower chance of success. So fertilisis shows you how high your lactobacillus concentration is and how high your concentrations of a bunch of other bacteria are. So as a result of that, you get this nice robust answer where you can see if, you know, there are um, good results or bad results. And do you need to treat with antibiotics? Do you need to treat with probiotics? Uh, and so on. So I love that because it really, in our hands, has made a big difference. From the immune standpoint, what you're really looking at is the opportunity to see if there are immune factors which are contributing to uh, a problem with your conception and your uh, ongoing pregnancy rates and so on. Um, so for the immune stuff, it's a whole wild world. Um, there is a whole group of physicians dedicated to reproductive immunology. Um, my very good friend, Dr. Fred Zaneku, who I uh, have nothing but respect for, a uh, great fertility specialist, great re reproductive immunologist, and his amazing wife, Chloe Romain. Um, there are, uh, you know, people that specialize in that. Um, I've done enough of it now that I feel pretty confident with what we do. Um, of course, as well. Um, and there are other people all across the world that do this also. So I think that that's a very reasonable, um, you know, kind of approach to look at the immune function, see if that's interfering, and then address individual specific concerns based on what you find. Unfortunately, it's very complicated. And so depending on what you find, um, there are different treatments which are applicable. So that's how we, we do it. Uh, what's the next question? Can we do back-to-back -back frozen embryo transfer? Um, yes, that's easy. <laughs> you can. Um, you probably need about a month in between to let the hormones wash out of you, but it is possible. And if you're doing natural cycle, you definitely could. So yeah, there are options to do it if you're not using a lot of hormones and stuff like that. Next question. Um, I prefer the fertilisys treatments be done before we do your embryo transfers. And it does take a couple of months to get through this. And especially if you have an infection, it takes time to treat it. So we always do our fertilisys testing before we're doing embryo transfers again. But I don't usually do it unless people have failed. It's not something I'm telling everybody to do. I don't think that's rational. Magnanimous T is not with us. Um, hi, KG. When do you do endosurgery? How do you doing endo? Is it like looking for black spots? Um, yeah. So endometriosis can take a variety of different appearances. Um, it can look like black spots or blue spots or brown spots. Um, it can have atypical vessels. There can be little indentations we call peritoneal windows in the peritoneal sidewall. Sometimes it's kind of firm and white. You can see adhesions. There can be cysts inside of ovaries. So there's no one specific pattern to endo. The most common is a blue brown spot or a blue black spot. Um, somewhere on the pelvic wall. Um, when do we do it? Uh, well, uh, I do it based on my patient's risk factors. So if I speak to patients and they sound like they have endo, I'll offer them surgery as one of the options for their fertility treatment because we know from studies that if you have endo and you get the surgical treatment, you are going to improve your chances of success. There's an endocan study which showed that. It's a Canadian endometriosis study. Um, and they demonstrated almost a doubling of uh, the success rates 
for pregnancy for patients that actually did, um, you know, the the surgery and had treatment versus those that just did the surgery and then they didn't actually do treatment, which you could never duplicate again. I don't think that study will ever happen again, but um, that's definitely, uh, you know, an option for people that's reasonable. Um, in terms of uh, how, do, how you do it, we do it all laparoscopically. So you make a tiny little hole in the belly button and you go through. Um, and then you're looking around and you get a very good view and you can move the camera right up close and see what you think it is. And then you have the option of either ablating it, which is zapping it, burning it, lasering it, whatever, um, or removing it. And if the endometriosis is deeper, um, what they call deep infiltrating endometriosis, the recommendation is it be removed. If it's superficial, it actually doesn't make a difference. And there's lots of fanatics out there saying, no, 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 it has to be excision surgery. That's actually not true. There have been studies of that, and it shows absolutely no difference between excision and ablation, as long as it's superficial. But if it's deeper, you need to do excision surgery. Oh, um, so this is a good question. Hi, Dr. VNT. You may have mentioned this before, but why do you not think Receptiva DX is a good indicator for potential endometriosis diagnosis? Is the BCL6 not a biomarker for inflammation? Um, so the guys that develop B, uh, Receptiva DX um, are hoping that it's a, a marker, but they've done studies demonstrating that it is not predictive. So the studies looking at the use of Receptiva DX, there's two now showed absolutely no value to doing the, the test. So that's why it's not useful because there's data showing it's not useful. Um, so I don't use it ever, it's, it's useless. And for people that think that they can find a test for endometriosis, literally one does not exist. There is no test for endometriosis. You can only do it by doing surgery, nothing else works. Yeah. <clears throat> Can women have cervical mucus after your period, leading up to your next period? And can the breast be sensitive as well as feeling pregnant with negative pregnancy tests? Yes and yes. So um, you can certainly have cervical mucus at any time in the cycle because the cervix on the inside of it is lined by cuboidal cells which um, and columnar cells, which produce a ton of mucus. So that's normal at any point in the cycle. Um, it does have changes in the quality and the quantity, but it's normal to have some mucus at every point in the cycle. Can you have breasts be sensitive and feel pregnant even when you're not pregnant? Breasts can be sensitive for a variety of reasons, ovarian cyst, estrogen production, um, you know, uh, anything rubbing up against the breast, uh, a bra that was too tight. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things that can cause breast sensitivity, cysts, um, in the breast. So yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily just from ovulation or, or just from a period coming or, or even pregnancy. Good question. Thank you, Angel and Neil. Can you review the donor egg process at your clinic and timeframe? Sure. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. So uh, we work with an amazing group called Babies Come True. Um, and they kind of head that up and we have a dedicated third party team of nurses and staff um, who manage all of that. So uh, step one, we talk to you and find out what your needs are and what your wants are and whether it's the right decision for you um, and why it's the right decision for you. And then um, you need testing. Uh, to make sure that your uterus is receptive and, and your hormones are good and your vitamins are good and all that stuff. And then once we've done that, the next step is to make sure that um, we have all of the testing for your partner or where, whoever the sperm source is, because that's really important as well. Um, once we've got all of those, the next step is to connect you with an agency and the agency will find you an egg donor. Um, once you have identified an egg donor that you like, we then have to screen them and then we have to test them. Screening is a very detailed set of questions to make sure that everything is perfect with your donor. Once we are happy that your donor is exceptional, we then test them to make sure that they're exceptional. And if you watched the show um, last week uh, or two weeks ago, we had um, some wonderful uh, ladies on who were previously um, egg donors and one was also a surrogate. So. Um, you can watch that show and catch up on all their feedback about that process. Uh, once we've um, made sure that they are uh, appropriate, 
We then need to do a genetic match with your partner and the egg donor to make sure there are no genetic concerns. And then you're ready to go for the IVF. So how long does that whole time take? Um, minimum kind of two months, maximum maybe three or four. It depends on how picky you are with finding a donor and how hard it is to, to get a donor. Um, but, but those are all reasonable, um, you know, time frames. Uh, there is a TikTok question. Let me ask that one real quick. Hi, Dr. V. Um, 10K HCG, oh, can 10K, 10,000 units HCG, be used to trigger the follicular part of a duostim five days before luteal phase? Um, you can. There's some concern with uh, HCG coming from studies um, I was partial to in uh um, the Denmark conference I went to and the Belfast conference I went to, that HCG can cause some um, either atresia or um, essentially death of the follicles that are left behind. And so there is kind of a suggestion that maybe HCG is not the best trigger to use when you're triggering for a duostem. I will say more and more that we are splitting our duostim cycles into two separate months. So we're doing a follicular phase in one month and then we're doing the luteal phase in the next month. We just did that for a lady um, today actually in her follicular phase, we did it, she waited five days, we checked, she only had three eggs. Um, so we said, wait a month, we brought her back and I think we got 11 or 12 eggs out of her this morning. So in a luteal phase. So in that situation, it won't make a difference what you use for your trigger. We do based on scientific reasons, and you can see our video on this from papers that have been published, always recommend a double trigger. So that's a GnRH agonist and some a little bit of HCG, um, which hopefully being a lower dose will mitigate the chances of that atresia um, that can occur with the uh, HCG if you're doing a back-to-back. -back. So something to think about. Uh, next question. And I don't know if there are any more on TikTok. Can TESI, which is a testicular um, uh, extraction of sperm, help DNA fragmentation despite good sperm numbers or is, I think they meant ejaculating three hours before enough. Um, so ejaculating three hours before you um, uh, do your IVF is not the point. It's three hours after. So you have to ejaculate once and then ejaculate again three hours later. And that reduces your risk of um, DNA fragmentation by 80%. So there's an 80% reduction in the amount of DNA fragmentation. So that's quite helpful. Um, Tessie has also been shown to significantly reduce the amount of DNA fragmentation. Either of those are good options. Um, it's just that ejaculating is a hell of a lot easier than getting a testicular biopsy. So it's easy to test. You can do a first sample and then do a second sample three hours later and just have them test your DNA frag before you even get to your IVF and you'll know how good or bad your, your DNA fragmentation is. If it's not good enough because the DNA fragmentation is still high, just, you know, jump ship and go straight to doing your, uh, your, um, a treatment with uh, the TESI, and that's a, a reasonable approach. Hi, Carla. Carla has a very cute puppy um, or dog. Uh, AMH 3.36 in woman at 40 years old means PCOS. Um, nothing means PCOS unless you meet the criteria for PCOS. So um, they have different criteria for this. Um, AMH is not part of the criteria for diagnosing PCOS. And without units, I'm assuming you're referring to nanograms per milliliter there, we can't talk about that. So um, uh, AMH is not part of that at all. <clears throat> Next question. Uh, immunomodulation, sure. I mean, if you have a reason for it, um, that's something we explore with Fertilisys, and then we have detailed discussions with our patients about the risks, the benefits, the costs, because some of the stuff is expensive, and then where it's going to lead to. So yeah, I mean, immuno immunomodulation is something we talk to patients about when it's indicated. Again, you have to have a very detailed discussion with your doctor to determine if this is right for you, and that's a very much one-on-one -on -one with your doctor kind of thing. 
Uh, can I discuss Pi 1 for GG from what I found is difficult to disconceive and carry full term? Yeah, um, I did miss that, Melissa. I apologize. Um, I didn't see that fly by. Uh, so, um, there is evidence for Pi 1 for GG that it can be difficult. Um, the truth is, with all these things that say that they're difficult, there's also other articles that say that it doesn't make a difference. Um, I won't use the Pi 1 as an example, but I will tell you, for example, with DQ Alpha, which is similar in concept to the Pi 1, there's one study that says it's literally the worst thing ever. It's impossible to get pregnant. The rates are abysmal, blah, blah, blah. And there was another study that said it made absolutely no difference whatsoever, like polar opposite discussions of the exact same finding. And then a third study said, no, both of those studies were ignorant. It's DQ Bravo, which is the problem, not DQ Alpha. So um, I'm not going to ever say that one little enzyme or one little gene is going to crush your chances because it's just not biologically true. In every single case, there are millions of genes and proteins and enzymes and uh, hormones and all sorts of things going on, all of which lead to success and failure. We're never going to find just one thing that's going to say, oh, you can't have a baby. There are things that say you can't have a baby. Azuspermia with no testicular sperm production. Okay. We can't fix that. There's no way. Um, you know, menopausal status in a woman, not impossible, but by and large impossible. Um, so, you know, there are certain factors, but it's never one single little protein or one single little test. Even women with the worst endo can get pregnant on their own sometimes after simple things like a hysterosalpingogram or laparoscopy. So um, having one little enzyme or protein, it is not going to stop you. So don't put all your faith in what you read online just because you have something like that doesn't mean you can't keep trying. Can you talk about HCG doubling time and when the HCG stops doubling? <clears throat> um, yeah, right about there, it's going to stop doubling. So, um, so HCG at the start rises quite slowly and then it kind of ramps up and becomes exponential where it doubles and then it plateaus um, when it hits its uh, you know, later levels. So uh, generally speaking from the very, very early first few days, it doesn't um, double initially, um, but once you're up into the, the hundreds, it will start to double. Once you're getting up into the tens of thousands, it's not gonna double because you're not gonna go from 10 to 20 to 40 to 80, to 160,000 because then by the time you were 10, 12 weeks where it peaks, um, you know, you'd have in the millions. And actually when you peak at about 10, 12 weeks, it's only around 100,000. So basically after about 10,000, it does start to slow down, even a little earlier than that. Great question. Back to the fertil list. I, I'm assuming they mean fertil cysts. Do you not do any of those tests in house? I feel like I've gotten my immune tested already. No, we can't do those tests in house. The very specialized tests, VRC does not perform immune testing in house. We are considering doing the infection testing in house. Um, it's very expensive to set that up, but I'm considering it because you can do it with the same equipment we do PGT with. And if we get the PGT system here, then we'll obviously integrate that other testing into it. Are we getting, um, oh yeah, you're getting all the questions. That's awesome. Thank you, Ali. What are the benefits of using HCG wash and intro lipids? So uh, HCG wash has been shown in a meta-analysis that it increases the success rates by as high as 30%. Um, and so the idea is that uh, once you form your embryo, it's formed in your fallopian tube. It takes a couple of days to float down into your uterus. By the time it's in your uterus, we think it's about a day three embryo. And then it takes a day or two to firmly attach. Um, so now it's a day five embryo. During that whole time, it is producing a small amount of HCG. So the theory is that maybe that HCG is necessary to facilitate the implantation of the embryo into the uterus. So the concept behind giving a little bit of HCG is to actually have a, a similar milieu to what would naturally happen. Intralipids is an infusion of fats 
that likely through something called PPAR, the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor mechanisms in your immune system, helps calm down your immune function. Um, so I like to refer to it as poor man's IVIG because we use it in place of IVIG because IVIG is insanely expensive and intralipids is actually quite reasonable. Um, and it basically kind of helps with patients that have overactive immune systems. Now it has to be specific to certain factors like the cytotoxicity of your NK cells and so on. But um, if you're seeing an appropriate physician, they're treating you appropriately, they can go through all of those things with you and discuss it and make it specific for you so that you're getting the right care. Um, Carla said, I got to read this one, buddy. Uh, Dr. V, um, I won't read that part. Thank you for take, taking the time to answer our questions. God bless you. God bless you too, Carla. Thank you for asking. Okay, go ahead. I just did that one. Does an oval-shaped euploid blastocyst have less implantation potential? Um, unfortunately, it can. Um, abnormal shapes to both eggs and blastocysts and sperm um, can all have an impact on the success rate, yes. Unfortunately, sorry, Jane. Yeah. Um, okay, that's a good question. So is 19% DNA fragmentation bad? Um, is it worth doing three hour ejaculation um, uh, or going straight to the TESI? So uh, the standardized accepted um, reference ranges for DNA fragmentation, zero to 15 is considered excellent to good. 15 to 25 is considered good to fair. Um, above 25, it's bad, basically. So um, you certainly can improve it with the three-hour ejaculation, um, but technically speaking, it's not necessary because you're in that good to fair category. And I certainly wouldn't do Tessie for a 19%. I got to take a TikTok question. I think I missed one or two here. Hang on, guys. Um, what tests do you run on your patients after an FET? So we do progesterone the next day in our practice. Um, and uh, aside from that, just their pregnancy test, there is nothing else to do. So we check their PROG levels the next day to make sure they're still stable, but that's about it. Um, and then they said, also, um, can you go from an egg retrieval into an FET? And the answer is, um, you can't go from an egg. Oh, I guess you could. If you did an egg retrieval and then you had frozen embryos, yes, you could go into an FET. Um, we never recommend that because your estrogen levels are still really high and the whole value of doing an FET is to have much more normal or estrogen levels. So we would not advocate for that. But is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Um, let me ask one more on TikTok because I missed another one too. Um, how long before egg retrieval should my husband abstain? Uh, depends on sperm quality. Talk to your physician. We recommend to our patients one to two days usually. Um, so we want you fairly frequent. What test do you do on your patients after a failed FET? Um, I talk to my patients after a failed FET. And then we come up with a discussion of what tests, if any, they want to do. So that's a very personalized discussion. There are circumstances in which I don't think any testing is appropriate. And then there are other circumstances in which I think people should do every test there is. Um, so examples, uh, you know, obviously if you have more than two failed euploid embryo transfers, you gotta be saying, wait a minute, something might be wrong. If you have, um, you know, untested embryos and you were 39 years old and you put one in, I, I'm not sure I'd tell the patient to do any testing because the likelihood is very high that that was because the embryo was genetically abnormal. So it's very personalized. That's something where you really have to talk to your patient and understand them and their needs and their desires and know their biology and, and then decide what to do. There is a litany of tests available. We do do and offer a lot of testing for some patients, um, but that's a situation where you call us, you become a patient, we go through the consultation process with you. Uh, fire ahead, Ali. <clears throat> um, can you explain? I know we did that one. 
Thank you, Dr. V. Uh, my RE is going to put me on fragment and aspirin to help with implantation. I have methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme and MTRR and MT. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, make, well, again, I can't give out patient specific information. Um, for patients who have methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme, God, I gotta be careful these days, uh, um, uh, mutations. What we recommend from the naturopaths is that they reconsider using folic acid and instead use um, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate so, um, or 5-methylfolinic acid. It's a little bit different. Um, however, I've read studies that say it makes absolutely no difference. So I take that advice from my naturopaths. It's not me providing the advice, um, but that's what we use. We switch to 5-methylfolinic um, acid. Yeah. Uh, how many days after five uh, that day or the next day? It's like within 24 hours. So the question was, how many days does it take for a day five embryo to implant? Um, and the answer is it's that day or, or within 24 hours. Uh, I've got a good question here too. Um, how does monitoring after an FET uh, done for patients that are out of country. Like I said, all you need is a progesterone level. Most of our patients stay the next day and come back to us and then they leave, so we already know. Um, but if they're going back home, they can just get a progesterone level. It's just one test and then after that, get a pregnancy test and then you're seeing your OB. So you don't need us anymore at that point. Yeah. What type of sperm sample is best? Um, so studies demonstrate that uh, fresh sperm is better than frozen sperm, but there was a recent study that actually, and, and that's a 30% difference um, in success rates, but there was a recent study that actually said that it's only important if the sperm is not good. Like, in other words, if you have a normal semen analysis, fresh or frozen has the same outcome based on this recent study. But if you don't have a normal semen analysis, fresh is going to be better than frozen based on the previous study. So that's what we're currently telling our patients. Yeah, so Nupigen is just another immunomodulator. The question is, hi, Dr. V. Uh, I've explained HCG wash. What about Nupigen wash? So, um, if you watch our video on YouTube about the five best ways to improve your FET, it does talk about the Nupigen wash. So Nupigen has been shown in studies to significantly increase the chances of pregnancy and live birth. Um, so we do do it in patients who have had failures before. It's not that expensive. It's very easy to do. So it's, it's one of the five things that we recommend, and there's a, a bunch of them. But it is an option for patients that have had unexplained failures, recurrent implantation failures, that kind of thing. And again, you gotta to talk to your doctor because you gotta make sure it's right for you. Um, but I'll also present the flip side. Some people don't believe it works at all. It's certainly not randomized controlled trial evidence. So um, you gotta look at that really carefully. Yeah. Is PRP something I recommend? Uh, I can tell you about the data. So the data on ovarian PRP is strongly lacking. There is only one study that demonstrates a very, very small benefit, and um, it was pathetically small. So there was a total of a 13% live birth rate in the women that did it. Granted, these were women with terrible chances on their own, um, and so, yeah, 13% is impressive for that group, but nevertheless, it's really low. And there's no proof that if you didn't just try one more time, you wouldn't get a 13% chance naturally anyways. Um, from a uh, uterine standpoint for endometrial thickening, um, I don't think anyone would question that it is effective. It's minimal. You see like a one or two millimeter increase, but it will increase the thickness. Um, from the standpoint of unexplained um, failures, the data shows, and I, there is a randomized control trial, we've reviewed it on the show, that it is very, very helpful. So in that regard, we, we support it. Excuse me, I think I missed the question on TikTok again. Should estrogen reach a certain point before retrieval? What is optimal? That's a great question. Um, so uh, for any of you that have done this, you'll know that 
The amount of estrogen is completely dependent on how many eggs you're producing. If you produce a lot of eggs, you're going to have a lot of estrogen. And if you're producing a low number of eggs, you're not going to have very much estrogen at all. So you never make the decision based on estrogen levels. It's purely based on the uh, follicles, how large the follicles are, how good the quality of the follicles is, that kind of thing. Now you use your estrogen level to guide you, but we're only using that as a guide. Um, so the question is, hi, Dr. V, what can I do to improve sperm morphology? Watch our YouTube video. Um, there's a YouTube video under the Fertility for Men section on our channel that talks about all the things you can do to improve sperm. Um, frequent ejaculation has proven to be beneficial. Vitamins have been proven to be beneficial. Uh, cold therapy has been proven to be beneficial. No smoking, no drinking, no drug use have all also all got data demonstrating a significant improvement. So. Um, those are the things we recommend because there's scientific studies to validate that. Again, I got to say this every single time, you got to talk to your own doctor and make sure that they are helping you. Uh, <laughs> how soon after a day five FET is blood serum HCG discernible? Um, yeah, I'm not going to answer that question because everybody's going to be banging down our door to do it earlier than we already do. So um, I plead the fifth. I am not answering that question. Wait for your 14 days. I know it's brutal. I know it's terrible. Wait for the 14 days because in those first few days, lots of stuff can go wrong. You need to wait so we actually know what the HCG level should be and can gauge if things are going well or not. So please, I know it's horrible. I know I'm asking a lot of you. Do not go doing home pregnancy tests and, you know, uh, beta HCGs any earlier than the 14 days. It's not useful. Um, do I suggest priming before an egg retrieval? Um, this is for Kara on TikTok. Tara, Kara, I recommend that you talk to your doctor and see what's right for you. Um, in some patients, we prime uh, liberally. I mean, we do it all the time. In other patients, um, not at all. So it depends on your history, um, what's going on. What I can tell you is we did present a study on the show probably six, seven months ago, maybe even longer, that demonstrated that estrogen priming was detrimental. So we don't estrogen prime, but there are other priming techniques. Um, you can use testosterone, uh, DHEA, human growth hormone. Those are frequent primers. Um, but you, that's a very, very patient-specific question, and, and each of them has its own merits. So it's not something you just kind of say, I want to do this. you got to have a valid reason to do it and kind of scientific support for doing it, for sure. <laughs> Someone on TikTok, TikTok says, it's so hard not to test. Uh, that's Brie. Brie, I know it's very hard not to test. Listen, I fully appreciate and respect the torture we are putting you through. But it's just going to drive you crazy. And that stress level we know is not good. So find anything you enjoy doing that's not bad. So no, you know, cocaine. <laughs> just like no marijuana, um, you know, normal stuff that you enjoy doing and do it to keep your mind off of this until your prank test. Stressing yourself out is just going to drive you crazy. And it's not like you're going to do one test. You're going to do one and then you're going to buy another one and then you're going to buy another one and you're just going to drive yourself crazy. And that level of stress will raise your cortisol levels and we don't want your cortisol levels raised. So please, I beg you, I beg you, I beg you, wait for the 14 days. Please, please, please. Yeah. What test do you typically recommend? Um, yeah, so again, Randy, uh, this is from Randy on YouTube. What test do I recommend for recurrent implantation failure, own eggs and donor eggs? I recommend that you talk to me. So um, it's not a testing situation. It's a very detailed history of everything you've done, how they did it, and then figuring out if something was missed. You know, I talk to patients all the time where, for example, they have endometriosis and then they got a hormone replacement therapy FET protocol or even a fresh transfer protocol. To me, those don't make sense. So I don't need testing. I need a different protocol. 
Um, and so it depends on the patient specific level of information. So for patients who have problems and, with recurrent implantation failure, um, that's definitely something I wanna take a very close look at. It is abnormal and unusual in our hands to see failures with donor eggs. So those are definitely ones where I would recommend testing. Um, but again, I need to know you as a patient, know what your history was, know what you did, know what the sperm quality was. I need to know your lifestyle. I need to know your body mass index. It's not something where I can tell you, go do this test. Um, it doesn't work that way. I'll just be having you do lots of useless tests and we find out, oh, your thyroid needed to be adjusted. You know, it, it can be something really simple or something very sophisticated and complicated. That's all the questions we have on Ali's end. Um, that's cool. Hey, I can't believe we got through it. Amazing. Uh, one more on TikTok and then we'll close it down. It's nine o'clock. What kind of protocol would I recommend for someone with endo before an FET? Um, again, I can't at answer patient specific questions, but I will tell you that our endo protocol um, involves uh, suppression um, plus minus uh, surgery. And then we use a lot of supplements and then we use a letrozole based protocol and high dose progesterone. And that's all scientifically based, based on stuff we've presented on the show. You can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, so hopefully that'll explain that. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I'm sorry for the glitches with our software tonight. Uh, I'm not sure why it was glitchy, but um, uh, hopefully it will uh, uh, be back up and running next time. Um, and wish me luck. I'm off to a conference this weekend to uh, see if we can bring in more patients to uh, VRC. I hope you guys all are having a wonderful day uh, and a wonderful week. If there's anything we can ever do for you, don't hesitate. Let us know. Um, and I will say good night on behalf of Tarek, who um, is uh, having fun in, uh, in another uh, country, <laughs> um, enjoying himself uh, on the uh, March break. And Ali, thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, thank you, Angel and Neil, for joining us. Melissa, Randy, all these people on there. Jane, I won't go through all of you, but uh, thanks, guys. Um, love you all. Have a great night and see you next week on Fertility Factor Fiction. Next week, we're doing mean tweets. So I'm going to share all the nasty stuff people write me um, and why I think they're all crazy. Uh, so hopefully you get lots of people to watch. It should be fun. Have a good night, guys. Take care. We'll see you later. Bye.